Uh, hello and welcome everybody and thank you for your time. Uh, glad to see everybody on this webinar on understanding ventilation and pressurization of critical spaces in healthcare facilities uh, hosted by Citra Systems. My name is uh, Rabia Mansour. I am the sales manager for the Middle East and Africa region based out of Dubai, accompanied by my colleague, Mr. Bryce Knudsen, based out of the US, who is the product manager for the critical environment solution. He will be asked, uh, presenting today for us this webinar. Uh, we will go through the main standards and codes uh, governing the critical spaces in healthcare, followed by uh, some application examples and some solutions that we are able to provide our customers. Feel free to type your questions as we go, and we will have a dedicated uh, Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Also, we will be having a couple of polls as we go, so would appreciate if you can answer those polls. Without any further ado, I'm handing over to my colleague, Bryce. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on your particular, uh, I guess, afternoon and evening, depending on your location. Uh, my name is Bryce Dutton. As Rabia mentioned, I'm the product manager for the healthcare space uh, for Cetra Systems. Uh, he mentioned a little bit about what we'll talk about today, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail uh, before we actually jump into it. Um, so first, we'll do a quick overview of ventilation and pressurization in healthcare. Uh, we're not going to dig into all the details, but uh, we'll, we'll dig into a few. Then we'll go through the common standards, accreditation and licensing. Uh, and then we'll go through the actual requirements that show up in some of those standards and the best practices in the industry. We'll go through a number of applications, um, primarily in critical spaces. Then we'll talk about how to select the right monitor and then provide you some options for solutions from Cetra. Um, I do want to note uh, the views and opinions here are expressed or implied do not represent those of ASHRAE, ISO, or USP. I uh, just want to make sure that that's very clear. All right, let's jump into it. All right, so a big overview of ventilation pressurization. As I said, we're going to stay kind of high level on this, but first the question is why? Why do we do this? The most important one that is very obvious, all this is infection prevention. And one of the biggest problems hospitals have today and on a daily basis is ensuring that people don't actually get sick in the hospital or that one patient who is sick doesn't spread it to the one next to them. This then follows on to be to, to the safety of the patients, the caregivers, and the actual staff as well. Additionally, we wanna make sure that we're always eliminating any contaminants uh, that might be getting into drugs or the care or into an operating room. And this applies especially in the compounding pharmacy space where we wanna make sure that we keep any contaminants from the rest of the facility out of that space so we don't actually end up then further passing that on. And then lastly, ventilation and pressurization provides patient and staff comfort within the facility. So how do we go about this? The primary things are monitoring and management of environmental conditions, with the very first one being pressure relationships, which we'll concentrate on mostly today. We make sure that we concentrate on pressure relationships because this ensures that contaminants stay out of spaces they shouldn't be in. It makes sure that infection, bacteria, and other viruses stay out of areas they shouldn't be in or stay in, in some instances, when we have isolation spaces. There's temperature and humidity. Ma ensuring that the temperature and humidity is correct in, the, in all spaces ensures that we don't create a breeding ground in a fantastic environment for bacteria to grow or further infection to, to arise. This also provides patient comfort. There's also air changes and air filtration. So this is a major piece of ventilation um, that makes sure that that bacteria, if it does arise or does show up, gets removed quickly and efficiently, and that we make sure that we keep the actual air clean. We're gonna concentrate a lot on pressure, uh, temp humidity, we'll touch on air changes. Uh, this webinar will not get too much into air filtration, uh, but the standards we talk about do help provide some key information on that. All right, so let's talk about, oh, this happened. 
I am showing that I'm not, my screen is not working. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulties with everyone here. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so let's talk about the primary standards that are involved in the healthcare space. The very top standard that is most common is ASHRAE 170, ventilation of healthcare facilities. So this standard covers everything from air changes per hour, pressurization requirements, temperature, humidity for all healthcare spaces. Um, ASHRAE, in hand with the Facilities Guidelines Institute, covers a majority of what you see um, in the United States and across the globe, and in MEA and India. The Facility Guidelines Institute used to actually duplicate a significant amount of the ASHRAE standard, um, but in 2018, they actually changed that, and now they just referenced the ASHRAE 170 standard. So the two actually complement each other very well. The Facility Guidelines Institute now provides more of a design and implementation guidance for ASHRAE 170 rather than trying to actually set the regulation. Um, following on that, we have USP 797 and 800. Uh, for pharmaceutical compounding. Now these cover hazardous and non-hazardous um, pharmaceutical compounding spaces. They're not the only USP standards, but they're the two primary ones that you pay attention to when you're talking about ventilation uh, and the environmental conditions within a pharmaceutical compounding space. Those coupled with ASHRAE and the FGI cover majority of what uh, is required. Now, locally, there's a number of uh, entities and standards. So in Dubai, you have Dubai Health Authority, Dubai Health Authority mostly references the ASHRAE 170 standard or follows pretty closely. Um, and then one of the big things that is interesting in this space is that we have a bunch of standards, but most of these standards are not enforced or licensed by the actual standard owner themselves. So accreditation and licensing is actually done by third parties usually. Um, the primary third party in this case is the Joint Commission International. So they provide accreditation, JC accreditation, but based on ASHRAE, FGI, and USP. Now, Dubai Health Authority does provide their own accreditation, um, but it's very, very similar to what Joint Commission does. Subahi uh, in Saudi Arabia is the auditing committee there, and they mostly cover ASHRAE 170 with some additional Japanese and Australian standards. So I think we have a quick poll on this right now. Um, the question is, do you consider ASHRAE 170 while designing healthcare facilities? That should pop up on your screen. If you guys can answer that for us, that would be great. So since ASHRAE 170 is generally the main source of uh, regulation, regulatory standards here, uh, let's talk a little bit about the changes and that, and that standard. So ASHRAE 170 recently released a new version in 2021, but I want to go back real quick to 2017. Um, in 2017, ASHRAE 170 split into three near almost identical sections. Uh oh, that poll made a mess for me. One moment. All right. So they split into nearly three nearly identical sections. This was actually intended because FGI had split their standard into three different sections, inpatient, outpatient, and residential living. So this was to better correlate. Now, mind you, in 2017, as I noted, they were almost identical. The inpatient and outpatient sections had almost no differences. The residential living section had a couple of differences. But for the most part, they actually admitted that they made this change so that in the future they could actually make them different. Well, in 2021, that actually was implemented. So they put in new outpatient residential living ventilation tables, which actually provide very detailed um, requirements for those spaces that are different from inpatient. Um, what was great here was they addressed urgent care and surgery centers more fully. In the past, they assumed an outpatient facility like urgent care or surgery centers operated like a hospital and, and that's just not necessarily always the case the issues and the ventilation systems all of that are a little bit different 
So now we have tables and guidelines that are specific. Residential living facilities obviously are very, very different than a hospital. So they provided ventilation tables there for that, which include a number of unique spaces like hair salons uh, that you would almost never see in a hospital or major health uh, center. They also added filtration requirements for each space. So now you actually have a MERV rating requirement for the filters on all of these spaces. They improved their guidance um, on anesthetic gas use. So what happened here was they had always assumed that anesthetic gas use required the maximum ventilation requirement. They recognize now that there's a number of other safeguards in place. So that you do not actually have to have the full ventilation requirements, the maximum ACH, uh, the full venting. So now you actually can do a little bit less, but still have anesthetic gas in use in a room. They also clarified the different imaging type spaces. Um, you know, there's a number of different spaces here that we won't jump into details of that too much. And lastly, they, they addressed, um, not technically in the standard, but separately spoke about pandemic related uh, standards. What they, but the one change they made to the spec that, to address that was they allow, they're now allowing isolation spaces to exhaust into your general exhaust system. In the past, any isolation space had to exhaust individually or 100% outside. So in certain cases, you now can do this as long as it's HEPA filtered. This was to make it so that they could, you could have more isolation spaces in a hospital. They've also recently mentioned a number of uh, individuals that there are discussions for the future about trying to add something for surge care space requirements. Um, just to be clear, what we're talking about here is if you're in a pandemic situation, you need a lot of extra space, usually for isolation. How do you build that out? What are the requirements of those surge spaces? And again, the, the, the conditions that you're under when this happens is a little different than when we're developing a new hospital. So they are talking about adding additions for that. Now, mind you, they only come out every four years, so we probably won't see that until 2025. But my guess is if they do something like that, they'll start we'll start hearing about that and seeing that in the revisions in the next couple of years. All right, so now that we have a high level under the, the standards and the changes, let's talk about some of the specific requirements around monitoring and pressurization, pressurization of these spaces. So this table here is the critical spaces in your healthcare facility. Um, we, this is primarily based on ASHRAE 170 and USP 7978 and 800, as well as some common design practices in the, in the region. So you'll see here the spaces we have are the operating theater, airborne isolation, um, the anterooms for that, protective environments, compounding pharmacies, and central sterile. Um, the first column here is about whether it is required to have a negative or positive pressure. And then the actual differential, which is set at 2.5 Pascal minimum, but the common practice is actually five Pascals. And then whether the spec, the specification, Rashray 170 or, or the current design standards in the region require constant monitoring of pressure. Not all spaces do, but in this case, pretty much all of them do except for central sterile, but it is very much the best practice. And then here's the temperature, humidity, and then an ACH requirement. Um, I think an important thing to note is all of these spaces, regardless of monitoring or temperature or whatnot, they all, except for the two anterooms, which I'll talk in a second, have an air change per hour requirement. Um, and understanding that and knowing what that it's actually happening is pretty important to infection control. Um, now, the anterooms do not have certain things specified. The interesting note here is they usually just go along with the primary room. Um, and the, real, the specification really tells you what that entire unit, so your airborne isolation room and your anteroom together have to have the spec of the airborne infection isolation room to the corridor, but the anteroom to the airborne infection isolation room doesn't actually have to meet the same standard as to the corridor. So it's kind of an interesting nuance there. So for example, your anteroom could be at one Pascal to the airborne infection isolation space, but the entire space, the anteroom to the corridor still has to be at two and a half. All right. All 
All right. Um, it should be noted that in the you know MEA in India regions, uh, constant monitoring and monitoring temp, humidity, ACH, and pressure all locally at the space on a monitor is generally considered mandatory. Um, Sibahi actually requires, and when the committee comes around to audit, they want to see ACH on the monitor. So we want to, the best practice either way is to monitor all of these parameters. Um, in the future, there is discussion and some spaces now as best practice are wanting to actually monitor their filter status for these spaces as well. All right, before we move on to some non-critical space discussions, uh, we have another poll. How many critical spaces does your facility have? Less than 10, more than 10, or not applicable? And we'll use this list here as, a, as a, the, the standard for that. We'll give you one second to answer that. Not surprising that most people have more than 10 uh, critical spaces in their uh, facilities. Abe, I think we're still just seeing the poll. We want to. There we go. All right. So let's move on and talk a little bit about the requirements for what we consider non critical spaces. Now, I want to be clear, we, we're using the term non-critical here, but that doesn't mean they're, they're unimportant. All these spaces are extremely important to infection control and eliminating contaminants and ensuring that patient and staff safety. Um, some of these, this list is not exhaustive. Um, we did not try to cover every single one. There are over 50 spaces that have pressure requirements per ASHRAE 170 that are not considered part of that, what you know is traditionally considered that critical list. Um, but I wanted to cover a few of the most common ones and ones where the best practice and the very common practice is to actually monitor them. So these are bronchoscopy, dirty and clean linen storage, uh, your morgue and your emergency departments. Um, an interesting note here is there's not an actual pressure differential requirement for some of these. It's just whether it's negative or positive and just making sure that that's the case. Uh, they do all still have temperature and humidity and air changes per hour. In these spaces, the, the best practice is often to just cover the monitoring, but it, it does not hurt when you're having your inspection or your audit to have additional parameters there monitored. Um, JC specifically does not require like strict monitoring these spaces, but we have heard multiple incidents where uh, a joint commission inspector comes in and sees a constant monitoring device on every single one of these spaces, and it turns that audit into a very pleasant experience for everybody. Uh, we had one customer actually reply that the, the JC auditor went around saw one of our products in all of these rooms on a single floor and then asked, is this on every single one? And is it just like that? And they said, yeah, absolutely. And he said, okay, the rest of the inspection for, I think it was about a 10 story hospital, took about 30 minutes when it came to inspecting those spaces um, because he just looked down the hall, saw they were all good and green and they called it good. So th there's definitely a lot of advantages to this. So we're familiar with the key spaces. Um, let's talk about like the actual application. All right, so the very first one is the most common one to everybody here, uh, especially in the current environment. 
uh, permanent airborne infection isolation. So in these cases, this facility is designed to be a negative uh, space. Uh, traditionally, it's negative five pascals to the hull. In this instance, we're using a velocity sensor to do air changes on the exhaust, a small temp and humidity sensor on the wall inside, and a well, our flex monitor on the outside to monitor all of that and display that. The flex monitor also has a built-in pressure transducer that monitors the pressure. Um, these spaces can be done up to about 10 pascal, uh, negative 10 pascals, um, but uh, sorry, but generally it's five, and uh, the ASHRAE does recommend in most spaces not to go above seven and a half. Um, the primary reason for that is that if you go above seven and a half, there is a potential to actually damage the seal on the room that helps make the, that pressure. All right. The next one we have here is actually kind of specific to pandemic response. This is a temporary airborne infection isolation space. Now this, as we noted, is not in the ASHRAE standard, but this is something that's coming up more and more. So in this instance, we actually have a room that was originally built for a balanced airflow, but we need to take make a negative airflow. So what we actually have implemented here is a air watch unit that we, we produce, um, and it's an actually an air purifier and negative room generator. You can actually exhaust the air that it takes in outside or up into, a up into an empty space or it back into a return. This is kind of one of those situations where if it's HEPA filtered, you now can exhaust into the general exhaust space. So that discussion that they're having about surge care and that new addition to ASHRAE 170 uh, makes this a lot more viable of a solution uh, when we need surge care. In this instance, we're not using a fancy monitor because right, this room doesn't have everything all set up, but we are using the central light. This provides you the pressure indication. Um, so now you do know whether it is or is not negative or positive. These are all, this is also a really fantastic application uh, for like urgent care spaces or spaces that aren't complete hospitals. They rarely have actual isolation spaces, or if they do, they have one, maybe two. All right. Uh, this next one here is actually an interesting one. This is like a isolation space for like an entire ward in a hospital. So maybe you have like a TB ward. Um, so they actually install an ante room with four isolation rooms off it. So you can use a flex monitor coupled with a number of lights to actually execute this, uh, this scenario. Uh, the other device shown here is actually a remote pressure transducer that can work with the uh, such a flex monitor on the outside as well. So protective environments. Uh, we won't get too crazy on this. This is exactly the opposite of an isolation space, right? Um, protecting cancer patients, people that are immunocompromised. Uh, and so we're doing the same thing here. Velocity sensor to do air changes per hour, which can then be displayed on this monitor here with the temperature and humidity as well. So surgical, uh, so operating theaters. So this is an example of an operating theater. There's a number of variants you could have, right? You could have additional ante rooms. You could have a storage room off of this that you also need to monitor. But in this case, we're using an, uh, a temperature and humidity sensor here on the wall. We have a particle counter as well, which is starting to become an option that we're seeing occasionally. A velocity sensor on the exhaust again, and then the flex monitor to monitor everything that's going on in that room. And this flex monitor is often gonna be integrated with the surgical panel inside the room as well. Um, again, this is a permanent space. The building is designed to manage it. Um, we also are using the Cetra light for the ante room and like adjoining spaces that are kind of considered part of the operating theater. So if you had an additional space, you could put another light in for that purpose. This is just a very simple monitor. Um, we have a, we, we talked briefly here about particle counters and there seems to be some trend right now that particle counters may be something that we see in the operating theater in the future. Um, we are gonna put up one more poll here. And the poll is, do you currently use a particle counter to monitor air quality in the operating theater? Or may you in the future? Or are you not aware of, of this, of particle counters in general?
Fantastic. Thank you very much. Oh, well, this is that is a fantastic response. So it looks like about 60% of people eventually will be utilizing particle counters in their space. All right. All right, let's see if we can get this back up here. There we go. All right. So the last application we're going to talk about is compounding pharmacies. Um, compounding pharmacies are probably one of the most complicated individual spaces in the in a, in a healthcare facility. Um, in this case, we're probably using multiple particle counters to make sure that the air quality is good throughout. Uh, we're using temp and humidity, which we're showing one here, but sometimes you will have multiple. And then we're doing exhaust velocity and likely more than one exit to make sure that we have the proper air changes per hour. Um, again, this space could additionally have storage units, um, hazardous waste or hazardous material storage. This one is specifically non-standard or non-hazardous. Um, the main difference between non-hazardous and hazardous is that the hazardous has a negative pressure requirement because you want to make sure you keep all of that inside the room. And the non-hazardous has a positive to keep contaminants out of the actual pharmaceutical products. Um, this here is also using the flex monitor to display everything that is shown in the room and the central light for the anterooms again. Uh, again, a five Pascal room pressure is very common here. The interesting one here is that sometimes the this pressure is brought up all the way to 12 and a half, half Pascals uh, to really make sure that we either keep something in or we keep the contaminants out. So we're familiar with standards now, we're familiar with applications. How do we go about choosing the monitors that we've shown here or go about choosing the right monitor? So the first question to ask yourself, is this a space critical or non-critical? Does it really, does it require full monitoring and why am I monitoring it? Do you need to monitor a single room for that space or multiple rooms? Are there ante rooms, scrubbing rooms, storage rooms? This depends on which monitor you choose because you might need a monitor that can do multiple rooms or at least display enough parameters to cover multiple on a single screen to cover multiple rooms. Will a pressure monitor also be used to monitor other environmental parameters? This is a little bit similar to the, uh, the first one, but are you going to have to, do you need to monitor ACH? Are you going to put tepid humidity on there? What else do you, may you want to put on there? Do you want to display something from your particle counter as well? Additionally, do you want to display something that we haven't even talked about today? Do the end users prefer to have an audible alarm for out of tolerance spaces? This is, an, this is always a bit of a debate. Um, an audible alarm is not required by the standards that we've talked about today, but it is often desired by the actual end users so that they know about it, even if they're not standing next to it and seeing it visually. The standards require a visual indication for most of these spaces, but not audible. Now, this can sometimes become a nuisance alarm. So this is sometimes, again, like I noted here, it's a it's preference of the users in the space, and it's good to get their input on this. We do recommend it because it sometimes the user preference will change based on the leadership in the space. And then lastly, um, future proofing. Are there future parameters that are not currently required? You don't have to do, but you may need to in the future. The really, a really important one on this is filter status. We may be asked to monitor filter status on these screens in the future. So you want to make sure you have a monitor that can do that. So let's talk about some products that can help you do this. So this here is not the entire Cetra product line, but it's the primary products that we sell into the healthcare space. Um, the first step, obviously, is, is sensing and detecting, right? So we have low differential pressure monitors. Here you see a, a 264. We have humidity and temp sensors. This is an SRH and the SRH 200. The particle counting, we have a number of models there that have Wi-Fi, that are handheld, um, that are can be portable, but not handheld. And then we have a velocity sensor for doing air changes. Then you want to monitor that and display that, right? So you have our room and environmental monitors. This is showing the flex and the light, our two most common. And at the bottom here is actually the air quality monitor. So the air quality monitor is coming this year right now. That's the plan. Um, it's not on the market yet, but this, uh, you know, keep your eyes open for this device. And then lastly is ACT. Now, 
Sutter is not primarily involved in the acting space, but in the COVID world with surge care, we are. Um, so we do have the air watch unit, which as I mentioned, is an air purifier and negative pressure unit. We see these used in a lot of hospitals that just don't, did, could not keep up during the pandemic. They didn't have enough space for to isolate all of the people that were there. So they implemented these. I think we have one hospital that has 50 units um, across, I think it's three hospitals in a small region. Um, and they move them around as necessary to, to meet that demand. All right. So the, the most important one here that we want to talk about today is pressure monitors and environmental monitors. Um, the there, the Cetra line contain, consists of four main products, the Flex, the SRCM, SRPM, and Light. And they are listed here in order of complexity from top down. So the Flex is our top end monitor. It provides everything you could possibly need to monitor any of these spaces, three rooms, 18 parameters, pressure, humidity, ACH, and you can get any, you know, whatever or back, you can use back net communication on this. Now, let's say you don't quite need that. You only have two rooms, you're only going to monitor pressure and maybe temp. And so SRCM is a good option for that. Um, it does also have a back net option. And then SRPM is our original single parameter, single room monitor. This has audible alarms, door switch, and you can get it in the back net option. So if you want back net, this is probably your best bet for just a single room, simple space. But we recently came out with the light a couple of years ago, and the light we believe is really the flagship product for your non-critical spaces um, and for those secondary anterooms. It's an analog output. It's a pressure transducer built in. It's simple. It's cost effective, and it pairs great when you put it with a flex for doing more complicated spaces. So now that we've kind of talked about all those. The, this is an overview of the product line from Cetra uh, based on application. So for your isolation and protective environments, it's generally the same equipment with negative pressure spaces having the option of a temp to make a temporary space using an air watch. So again, we have the Flex, the SRH, and the SRVH. And we do sell these kind of packaged in the way you see them here as well. And then the operating theater. Again, the Flex, the SRH 200, and a velocity sensor. This 200 is a more accurate temperature and humidity uh, unit, and it has backnet uh, communications. So the SRH only has analog, but the SRH 200 has backnet as well. And then we also have the a whole line of particle counters that you can implement as well. Compounding pharmacies look similar to operating rooms with the addition of the light for all of your ante rooms. There's almost there is always an anteroom for the compounding pharmacy. The operating theater, you could also use that for an anteroom. I note here, obviously, lights for anterooms. And then non-critical spaces, we recommend the light paired with an SRH if you want to also manage temp and humidity. Now, in this case, you wouldn't be locally displaying your temp and humidity like on the light. You can't do that. But you would at least have it in your building management system. So. We've talked about standards. We've talked about why we do this. We've talked about what the major parameters are to do to, to make sure that our place, space is properly ventilated and pressurized. Um, we've talked through applications and the products that are available for that. So what's next? What's next is to identify the critical and non-critical spaces with pressure requirements in your building. And additionally, identify what other requirements they have. You can use ASHRAE 170 for this. A number of other guidelines, the ventilation tables in ASHRAE 170 are one of the best sources for this. Uh, and we've summarized them a little bit in this presentation. Um, while you're doing that, make sure you evaluate the manual effort that you're putting in to monitor these spaces. Often, especially for the non-critical spaces, we're doing walk-arounds daily or maybe even weekly to, to check all of these spaces. And as everyone noted, you have more than 10 critical spaces. So you probably have way more than 10 non-critical spaces. So whether you're doing a smoke test or a, a, a little paper flow test, you may be spending a lot of time on this. So these are targets for improvement. Then talk about any future expandability requirements you may have for the spaces, like we said, future proofing. Then upgrade the non-compliant spaces first, obviously, right? I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer, no but 
just wanted to make sure we note it. This is usually probably going to be through HVAC and control system upgrades. Next, upgrade the compliance spaces that can benefit from advanced monitoring. Um, you know, the best practice for the facility, for patient care, for the outcome of patient care, is to make sure that we're monitoring and we know that all our spaces are in spec all the time. Doing the weekly, the monthly, the, the yearly balance, we cannot guarantee that all year that that was actually the case. That, does, that, does, that is not the best practice. So additional local monitoring. And again, we talked about that you maybe actually might have some labor savings in these instances. Your team, your nursing staff, even your facilities team, their time is better spent taking care of other things than walking around and making sure that your linen closet is properly pressurized. And lastly, educate your staff on use of the monitors. If your staff, your nursing staff, if all the staff in the facility aren't familiar with what these products actually are and how to use them, a couple of things happen. They ignore them. They just go, what's that silly thing on the wall? And they're not interested. And sometimes they don't even realize there's an actual problem and they don't know how to, what, who to talk to. And then second, nuisance alarms. What we see sometimes is staff doesn't really know what it is. It becomes a nuisance alarm. They mute it and then nothing gets done about it. Now, we're all thinking that never happens in my facility. People are not gonna do that, but uh, it does happen. And so we want to avoid that. So making sure we educate staff and that they're, pre they're prepared to act on an alarm is the final step in all of this. Now, that I've covered all the products and everything, I think Rabia is gonna talk a little bit about some of the projects we've done in the region. Yeah, thank you so much, Bryce. So uh, we do have an excellent presence across the region uh, with, this, with this just being a small snapshot of our, some of our notable wins. Uh, our presence in the region extends across all of the GCC uh, and across the Middle East, serving all different critical areas within a hospital uh, in those countries. Uh, just some uh, noteworthy projects and references is Al Rahba Hospital, uh, where we have been selected as the solution provider for all pressurized spaces. And now Al Rahba acts like the largest center for uh, isolation in the Emirate of, of Abu Dhabi and across the region. Uh, another uh, great example is the uh, work that we have done with the King Faisal Specialist Hospital to supply our solutions for all of the upgrade work that is happening for the critical spaces and the pressurized zones within that uh, really large facility. Uh, as well as we do have multiple successes with uh, healthcare chains across the region with the example of Saudi German healthcare uh, where they have hospitals across the GCC in North Africa, and uh, we partnered with SGH to be the uh, supplier of choice when it comes to the critical environments and the solutions for monitoring that they have. Uh, something else is Almana Hospital uh, Group, where we do have uh, agreements in place for the multiple areas, for the multiple facilities across the region of Saudi Arabia. Uh, with that said, uh, we look forward to working with any of you uh, guys on your pressurized space requirements and hope we, we are able to provide you with the solutions that are needed. With that, I think it is time to jump into the Q&A session. Feel free to type any questions in the question pane in the uh, GoToWebinar software that you have in front of you. So we do have one question. Can we have both control and monitoring on the products? So, uh, the, so the only product that Cetra currently provides that has control is the Flex. So the Flex does provide one output that has a PI loop. So you could do that with the flex. We do see uh, people control VABs utilizing the flex based on pressurization in the room. I guess in theory, you could also possibly control a temper humidity requirement using usually utilizing that as well. That doesn't answer your question fully, just 
feel free to type additionally in the space there. We have Firas Khatib, you have your hand raised. Do you have any question? If you can please type it into the questions pane. We we'll allow a couple of extra minutes for anyone with a question or a requirement. Okay. All righty, we don't seem to have any other questions. In case you have, oh yeah, we have a question by Mohammed Rashid. So how can we understand the plus five Pascal pressure difference? Um, so I believe the question is, let me make sure I understand, um, is to how do you actually measure the plus five Pascal pressure difference? I guess we did not, quite point out that all of our pressure monitors include a pressure transducer as well. So each of our pressure monitors has a differential pressure transducer. Uh, SRCM and Flex both can have actually remote pressure transducers as well as an onboard pressure transducer. Uh, Cetra Light, it's built in, same with the SRPM product. So they actually are your pressure um, monitor. They're, they're not just a monitor, they're actually sensing the pressure as well. If that doesn't ask your question, um, please type again there for us. Another question by Mr. Suleiman Girit. Uh, do you have any applications in Europe? So do we see the same thing of requirements in the European region? Uh, so the question there, I believe, is if you're asking about particular products or anything for Europe, we, we do sell a number of these products in Europe. The most common application in Europe actually that we see is the SRPM product. Um, we also have a number of lights at a couple of facilities there. Um, trying to think of any others off the top of my head. The SRPM is the primary unit that gets sold into the European market. Uh, the main reason for that actually is it is a surface mount product and a lot of the buildings in Europe do not have their, their walls that they're putting these on are not as deep as what some of our in-wall products are built for. So the, the SRPM is a, is a great option for that because it's mounted on the exterior. The truth is though, the flex monitor, by the way, can also be mounted on surface mount. We have a kit for that as well. Again, if I, yeah, just, if I didn't quite fully cover that, please. Uh... And just a quick addition to this point in the European market, uh, we see a lot of specification and guidelines uh, classifying the operation theaters as an ISO classified space. So it's not just pressure that gets monitored. We see also the air quality via particle counters there. Thanks, Rubia. Pleasure. Uh, another question by Harun Sayahi. Uh, you have centralized pressure monitor. If you have how many rooms it can monitor? I think this is around the MRMS. Oh, this is a good, okay. That's a, so there's a the MRMS. Let me just go back real quick. The SRCM unit actually has a sister monitor called the MRMS, or we kind of refer to sometimes as a nursing station. Um, so they actually communicate together and you can monitor up to eight rooms on that. Um, additionally, if, if that doesn't fully answer your question, the flex monitor can handle three rooms as well. So you can actually feed the data from the individual devices from two other rooms into a single flex for lesser applications. 
thanks, Bryce. Another question by Haroon is, can you include temperature and humidity in the same pressure monitor? So you can do temperature and humidity on the flex. So we can put temperature, humidity, pressure, pressure all on the flex unit. You do have to have obviously an external temperature and humidity sensor for that. We don't build that into a flex monitor at this time. Um, SRCM does also have the ability to display that as well. Yep. And this is a good place to again note the flex can can display up to 18 parameters and it can display just about anything you can feed it over analog or backnet. Um, so you can customize it if you have some other parameter that we haven't even talked about today or that is unique to your application it can display that as long as you can make that turn that into a backnet or analog signal. Thanks, Bryce. We did see a couple of requests for the presentation. We will be sharing a recording with everybody uh, who registered for this. We have a follow-up question by Suleiman Gurit, uh, I think mentioning any references or a hospital application reference for the SRPM. I think we can do that with you, Suleiman, uh, after the presentation, after the webinar, no issue. A uh, question by Mr. Axine. Do we need to disassemble the Cetralite for calibration? So the Cetralite would have to be sent in for calibration at this time. Um, we are talking about solutions in the future to avoid that. Okay, excellent. A question by Mr. Hamza Salim. For the Cetral solutions monitors being offered, would the communication be over TCP IP or RS-485? So that slightly depends upon the monitor. Um, the Flex monitor can do all of those options. Uh, the SRCM monitor can... Hmm, can you remember, I, I used to remember, I just yeah, blanked is, on the IP. The, the SRCM and the SRPM, they do the RS-485 right. MSTP, so backing it over MSTP. The Flex has the IP option. Yeah, that was perfect. The light is an analog only at this time. Correct. A question by Mr. Abdullah Hussein to share a soft copy. We will try to share with you uh, also the, the slides, no issue. A question by Mr. Murthy. We can maintain humidity only through AC or we need a humidifier as a must. So I think this question is a little bit about the standard. Um, the standard allows you to do this in multiple ways. Most of the standards, at least ASHRAE 170, leaves this kind of up to you exactly how you execute that. Um, I, I think, think that's about all I can really say to that. I mean, this to me would be, you know, some of this is best practice or design choice. Why, thank you. And a question by Mr. El Khidr. Is there any software we can connect with our PC for to monitor all the isolation rooms? Maybe we could have Sims here, Bryce. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think this is so. I'm going to I'm going to go out and, and assume you don't have a building management system, or that you have a third party that doesn't normally access your building management system and wants to monitor that. Maybe your idea here is that you have a bunch of isolation rooms and you want to monitor them all at, you know, where the nurses sit or in some central location, but just those. Um, we have a product called Critical Environment Monitoring Software, and it's built just for this. So the short answer is, is yes, we do have a uh, software for that. And I think, uh, you know, Rabia can help you understand that better. And there is some content on our website for that. Uh, we didn't, we were concentrating a little on pressurization and the monitors for this uh, presentation. Uh, feel free to reach out to us, El Hassan, over the email ID that we have, info.mea, et cetera, dot com. Uh, we can take that discussion in more depth. No issue. Looks like I we see a, a backnet IP MSTP question again. I think we, hopefully, we already answered that. Uh, just short, in case you missed it. Uh, yes, the Flex and SRCM do IP and MSTP. And then the SRPM only does, um, or sorry, I said it backwards. SRCM yeah, only does MSTP. The, the flex, yeah, correct. 
as SRPM does MSTP as well. Correct. We have a question regarding um, all the pressure monitors type you show, they have the same reading time from the sensor. So I think this is maybe around where is the pressure sensor? On the majority of the room monitors that we showed here, the pressure sensor is actually on board the monitor. So you have a real time reading of the pressure value. Uh, with one option on the flex to have an external pressure sensor that is not on board the monitor and you will be taking the real time data as well. Yeah. The, the special note too on the flex would be that if you're taking that remote pressure sensor direct to the flex, which is what we recommend and your reading time is very short. If you're taking it back through a controller and through your BMS and then back out through BACnet to the flex unit, it could be, there could be some delay there. Um, hopefully that answers your question. If not, please, please shoot us an email or, or ask further and we'll try to, to clarify that. We have a question from Mr. Al Sayed. Regarding the IVF labs, what are the other environmental parameters that should be monitored and is it available in the Citra Flex type of a monitor? So I did not touch on the IVF lab specifically in this. Um, ASHRAE 170 does provide in uh, a spec for this in the outpatient one. I do not remember off the top of my head the exact parameters for that. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to see if I can grab that real fast. But and I don't from know. a regional perspective, what we have been coming across regarding the IVF labs is we see a requirement for pressure, humidity, temperature, air changes, and the quality of the air via particle counters. So usually this is what we see and come across across the region. And the short answer would be the flex would be able to handle all of those parameters for you. Yeah. Um, the, the, the IVF lab generally looks and i think we we're talking about lab we're we talking about the room where they actually do ivf or preparation space so preparation space though i do think they're pretty similar the actual procedure room is often considered not an operating room but not too far off they're usually kind of uh they're nearing that which i think uh rabia's note about what we see in the region uh answer, speaks to that Going uh, through another question by Mr. Firas Al Khatib, can we use ACH for SRCM? Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, reach out directly to us to discuss this in more detail about how it could be done. Yep. Yep. You could uh, do another that. question by Mr. Zahid Okar. So the flex is IP or MSTP or both MSTP and IP at the same time. So the flex offers you both protocols and you have the liberty to select one so if your infrastructure is primed around backnet over ip you can use the ip port on the flex if it is mstp you can use the mstp ports on the flex yep. you can't use both at the same time we have another question by mr surish kumar please clarify the srp and parameter list uh, the SRPM is a, for a single room, one parameter, that is pressure. You only have an additional input for the door status. So the primary parameter is pressure only. Okay, so we have another question by Hassan Al Khadr. Uh, is there a module or a controller to connect the pressure monitoring system with our BMS? uh if i have the citra brand so if i understand your question correctly al hassan um all of the devices here can be connected to the bms regardless regardless of the brand uh, that you are using but we are not offering a a standalone controller if that is what you're looking for yeah we have I'll, just um, the pi loop on the flex yeah i could touch a little more on that i think so um, obviously, if you're using Flex or uh, SRCM or SRPM with BACnet or, um, you know, the MSTP capability, 
those can direct connect usually into your BMS system. If you're using a light or one of our analog options, you're gonna need some kind of control option to, to translate that in most instances. It really depends also though on your BMS system specifically. This is a, so I think this is definitely an area to reach out to us and we can help you identify the best solutions. We are familiar with the space and we can help you identify good solutions for that as well. Another question by Mr. Murat. Uh, do you have EX proof options for flex device for the military sector? I, unfortunately, I, we don't have any explosion proof uh, certification on any of those devices as the primary segment is the healthcare and uh, the pharmaceutical segment. Maybe in the future. I'll make note. And Murat, please reach out to me to, to discuss this if you come across this requirement more often. We have another question by uh, Al Sayyid Jaheen. So, is there any module or monitor for the efficiency of HEPA filters for a VOC test? Huh. So, typically for the VOC and the TVOCs, we do have the handheld particle counter that you can use for monitoring and taking the readings for the space you're interested in. And hopefully with the launch of the AQM, you would have a continuous monitoring of uh, the uh, overall TVOCs. For monitoring the HEPA filters, usually the solutions are either a differential pressure switch mounted across the filter to give you an indication if it's clogged or not, or you can use a continuous differential pressure transducer to have a continuous reading about the pressure drop, which will indicate to you uh, the amount of dirtiness or how clogged your filter is. So this is typically uh, the solutions that we see. Alrighty, we have the last two minutes. Any other questions? Give it a couple of seconds. And again, just as a simple reminder, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to me or to info.mea, et cetera.com. Just a quick question by Mr. Onais. How we can calibrate this monitor? Uh, is it self-calibration or a third party? So that Price. depends on the monitor. Um, so, you can do calibration on site. We actually sell calibration equipment uh, that you can utilize to calibrate Flex, SRCM, and the SRPM on site. Uh, the Cetra Light does have a local zeroing function, which, especially for non critical spaces, is usually more than sufficient and doesn't really require calibration in those instances. Otherwise, you would have to send those back to us, but you're always, well, you know, you can always get a third party to that. There is not an actual self-calibration solution other than the zeroing function, which all devices actually have as well. With that, I, I thank you again, everybody, for the time you took today. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, thank you for the participation. And we look forward to support you and be able to provide you with solutions for your critical requirements. Thanks again feel free to reach out to us with any questions or requirements. Have a great day. Thank you.